Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to worship here at the First Presbyterian Church. Those of you who are here with us and those of you who will be watching online later. Uh, if you look in the back, there is a place for filling out liturgists for the rest of November. If you wish to be the liturgist, I'd appreciate it if you'd sign up. Next to that is a sign for December. I'm going to be choosing liturgists depending on what we're doing with the uh, Advent candles, so don't sign up for those. But I think this December is, to is a month to celebrate as our church, and I think we should do cookies every Sunday in December. So, there's a place for you to sign up for cookies every Sunday in December, and I have a feeling I'm going to get more sign-ups there than I do for liturgists. Um, uh, please take advantage of that. Uh, as many of you know, Letty Badenhop is in the hospital. She had a breathing episode that led in the hospital to a heart episode leading to they don't know what it is. And so she's in Fulton County Hospital until they're sure that she can come home. Please keep her in your prayers that they can figure out what they can do uh, so that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. And she is the card of the week, so please sign it. I had said in my email that I was going to give donuts to people who showed up at 9 o'clock because they uh, uh, got messed up with their clocks. Nobody showed up except for the people who normally show up at 9 o'clock anyway. And there's a lot of extra donuts over there, not enough for one for everybody, so either cut them in half or after the service is over, run, whichever you prefer. Um, on Tuesday is the election night supper. Setup is at 3 o'clock on Monday night, and I believe we're peeling potatoes that night. Uh, cooking is going to start early in the morning. Jana is the person who has the list of what everybody's doing and when you need to be here, so check with her. Jana, do you have empty spaces you still need to fill? Okay, if you plan to come and you don't have anything assigned to you, we need people to actually serve the food with a smile. We would love to have you do that. And if you show up, I'm sure we will put you to work. Uh, tickets are being purchased from Patricia if you wish to buy tickets for yourself or somebody else. Congregational Life meets on Thursday. Friday is the Ladies' Light Out Unknown Tour, the thing that we started selling tickets for back in February. And I understand it's completely sold out. Uh, when is the church meeting there? So we're going to try and get there. Um, some of us are carpooling, but the rest just kind of meet at 6 o'clock. We have early entry tickets, so there's kind of a VIP status that we got come with our tickets. And that one will allow us to get in because first come, first serve on the seating. That way we Meet at 6 at Crossroads Church. Uh, you see the rest of the announcements in there. Finally, I'd like to read a Facebook post to you, and we'll let this be our minute for mission. Uh, this is from Together We Can Make a Difference, who we, we've supported with food and who we support with the church's money. They write, Happy 14th anniversary to us. We opened our doors 14 years ago yesterday. And it was 19 days before anyone else walked through them seeking help and a kind face. We naively thought we'd be here maybe five years. We're glad that we're still here, but we're sad that we still need to be here. There is a mistaken idea that people living in poverty are lazy and worthless. The majority of the people we serve are working in our community at factories and fast food restaurants and seasonally in the fields. But these same people can't find affordable housing or aren't paid enough, even with multiple part-time jobs, to afford rent and, or their living expenses. For those who are unhoused, they cannot receive any services from the agencies without an address. Many of these folks turn to couch surfing or living in their cars. The items we provide help people to be and remain clean, healthy, socially acceptable, 
and employable. We also try to be a force that reminds each individual that they are worthy and that they matter. When COVID closed down the world, including local food pantries, we were able to reopen sooner and found ourselves receiving food donations. But we were also receiving many more calls for help needing food. In November of 2023, we decided to fully embrace being a supplemental food pantry as well as a toiletry pantry. We are also seeing our numbers increase over the last year, and we know it's not financially sustainable for us. Many who have not been to us for services for two or three or even eight or 10 years are needing help again. We keep a little model school bus on our shelves to remind us that we aren't driving the bus. The road has twisted and turned and led us into roads and routes we have never expected but it continues to be an amazing ride. And with faith in the driver, we're still there. Thank you to everyone and everyone who has helped and continues to help us on this ride. Are there other announcements that need to be shared that I've missed? Uh, hearing none, let's continue our worship with the welcome. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. Stand firm and hold fast to your faith. God will strengthen us in word and deed. For the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father loves us. And gives us grace, encouragement, and hope. Let's pray. Creator God, you have filled the world with beauty. Open our eyes to behold your gracious hand in all your works, so that rejoicing in your whole creation, we may learn to serve you with gladness. For the sake of whom, him whom by whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
may be seated. Our psalm today is Psalm 146. It instructs us not to place our faith solely in human leadership. The psalm lists those who are cared for by God, predicting a time of final justice and providing hope for those in need. And I'll tell you, when I realized this was the psalm for Sunday, I called my brother and I said, the psalm we have for Sunday is the best psalm I could choose to read the Sunday before an election. So let us praise God through the response of reading of this psalm. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. Who may never and earth succeed at all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphan and the widow, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God will sign for all generations. Praise the Lord. Jesus, our Lord, frees us from the prison of sin and opens our eyes to his love and grace. Jesus condemns our wickedness and cleanses us from all evil, making us new people in him. Together, let us accept Christ's work in our lives and confess our sins. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you love us, but we have not loved you. You call, but we have not listened. We walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped in our own concerns. We condone evil, prejudice, warfare, and greed. God of grace, help us to admit our sin, so that as you come to us in mercy, we may repent, turn to you, and receive forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Please take a moment for our silent prayers and confessions. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear the good news. Our righteousness is found in Christ alone, a gift of God by faith. So beloved people of God, believe that through the grace of Jesus Christ we are forgiven and be at peace. Please take a moment to greet one another with God's peace and grace.
Our special music has to do with the subject of our scripture. It's entitled, Our Great High Priest. Uh, it is meant to be evangelical. So you're going to see two other languages translated underneath it. One is Hindi and the other is Tugulu, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, another language from India. And that's why this was produced by a group called All Nations Ministries.
Please pray with me. God, will you continue to speak to us as you spoke to us through that music, through the reading of your word and the preaching of your word, so that by your Holy Spirit we may learn what it means for you to be our great high priest, the cost that it gave came from you and the wonderful blessings that come from it. In Christ we pray, amen. Our sermon text is from three passages, part from Hebrews 2, part from Hebrews 4, and part from Hebrews 7. It says, Therefore he became, had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. And from Hebrews 4, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And then from Hebrews 7. Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness, 
But the oath, which came after the law, appointed the Son, who has been made perfect forever. This is the word of the Lord. The devotional that I post on Facebook each day is not the only devotional I look at. I started reading a devotional called Today from the same website that Seeking God's Face is on. And on Saturday, I read the devotional and discovered it was just perfect to begin my sermon. So Ben McKnight, a pastor in the Christian Reformed Church, writes this. I often picture God sitting on an ornate throne made of the rare metals, adorned with priceless jewels, and upholstered in the finest fabric. Some Bible passages portray God in a similar way. But what if, for a minute, we close our eyes and quiet our souls and imagine God differently? What if God, still in God's glory and splendor, isn't sitting in lavishness associated with royalty, but instead is sitting at the corner booth of a local coffee shop or on the couch in your family room, eagerly awaiting you? What if God, who is so excited to see you, leaps from his seated position and embraces you like a friend who longs to hear how you are doing and what you've been up to? What if God, in both his divine and human nature, gives you his undivided attention as you share with him your life, your story, your joys, and your concerns? Uh, Ben McKnight is being a little imprecise with his language because he should have said Jesus in both his divine and human nature, particularly because we associate the God on the ornate throne with as God the Father, but I like his point. The struggle I have with it is that if you lived in the early church at the time that the book of Hebrews was written, nobody would have thought of God that closely. Hebrews was written trying to figure out who God is, and it was written before we developed the Trinitarian language. We used to talk about that language. The book of Hebrews is actually addressing it by saying, from Hebrews 1 and 2, God, Jesus is greater than the angels. From Hebrews 3 and 4, Jesus is greater than Moses. From Hebrews 5 and 7, Jesus is greater than the priests at the temple. I put the conclusion of all three of those sections in today's reading because each of them points to what he gets to in Hebrews 8 and 9, that Jesus is the great high priest, the royal high priest, excuse me, or the eternal high priest. You see, to to somebody in the first century, a Jewish person or a Roman or pretty much anybody, the idea that God would be that close to you, as Ben McKnight talks about, would be ridiculous. Because gods were gods, and humans are humans. Gods are the creators. We are the created. And to bridge the gap between them, you needed something in between you. You needed something to to mediate that relationship. You needed some formal way of addressing the gods because you couldn't just imagine God coming down to say hi to you. Way back in Exodus 19, when Moses went to talk to God at Mount Sinai the first time, the Lord said to him this, You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you fully obey me and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and the holy nation. These are the words that Moses was to speak to the Israelites. And as you know, while he was up there talking with God, they were down there doing the golden calf. But in the scriptures, even before they proved how faithlessness Israel was going to be, God gave Moses the details of the temple. And the temple had these 
levels of holiness, the, this gradation, this, this distance that you put the common people away from God. There was an outer part of it where only certain people could go. And then there was an inner part of it where only certain people would go. Then there was the temple proper, and then there was the Holy of Holies where almost nobody ever went. And when David built the temple, it was the same way. There was the outer court that the Gentiles were allowed into, the inner court where Gentiles were not allowed, only Israelis and only clean Israelis. And then there was the inside of the temple for the priests, and then the Holy of Holies where one person went once a year. And so there, was the, there were these barriers between God, the creator, and the people who followed God. And the people who mediated those barriers were the priests. The point of the priests is that they were instructed to know the things of God. They were to know what the law was. They were to know what offerings to give. They were to know the proper way to give the offerings and the timings and everything. They, want, they knew what God required even though they, as humans, couldn't follow it completely. As one of our passages said, they had to offer sacrifices for themselves before they could go and offer sacrifices for the people. But if they were good priests, they not only knew the things of God, they knew the people. And they knew the people's struggles. And they knew what, what was bringing people to the temple. And he knew what was going on. And so the priesthood had this pastoral role from the priests to the people, but also this ceremonial role between the priests and God. But you read our passage, and our passage says that all of Israel was to be a kingdom of priests. All of Israel was going to be a holy nation. How was all of Israel going to be a kingdom of priests and holy nation when the law declares a small subset of them to be their priests? In our passage, there's an if. It says, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant. And this if functions in two ways. One, if they were not following God, if they were not keeping the covenant, it meant they didn't want to be the priests. They didn't want to be a holy people. They wanted to be just like everybody else. They didn't want that special role. But more importantly, I think that if they obeyed and if they kept the covenant, it was through the obedience and through the covenant keeping that they became this kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Think of it, the, the ethical demands that the law requires, the care for the poor the law requires, the Sabbath rest the law requires, the festivals of thanks to God that the law requires, all of these were setting up an image of a very different God than the gods of all the people who were around them, who didn't care what you did as long as you gave the offerings. And those gods were cruel and needy and capricious and evil. And yet, when we read the history of Israel, we see them wandering away. We see them failing to keep the covenant. We see them worshiping the gods around them. And even when they were faithful, there was this trend that pulls the people away from God. I mean, the, the tabernacle used to travel with the people and now it's fixed in one place and everybody has to come to it. The, the, they used to be run by people who were called by God. Now it's a hierarchy, David's lineage. And after two generations, the country splits and the top 10 tribes can no longer come and worship at the temple. Um, by the time of Jesus, the temple had been destroyed. It had been rebuilt. It was run by the Sadducees, and the Sadducees cooperated with the Romans, and the Sadducees cooperated with the Romans because they had to, because if they didn't, the Romans would get rid of them and bring in other people who would cooperate with them. 
Because Roman religion had no concept of a covenant. It had no concept of an ethical life that's related to worshiping God. All they cared about is that correct offerings were presented at correct times to the Roman God. So they figured if we offered correct offerings at the correct times to the Jewish God, it's the same. And so as long as the Sadducees went through the motions correctly, and the Jewish festivals where everybody came to Jerusalem went off peacefully, the Sadducees were able to keep their jobs and they were able to keep their heads and that's why they cooperated. And on Palm Sunday, Jesus came to the temple and shut it down, calling them a den of robbers and then stayed for the rest of the day teaching. The next day he, they, he came, they asked, by what authority did you do this? And he tricked them and he said, by what authority did John the Baptist preach? And they were, didn't answer that question because they were afraid of the crowd, so he didn't tell, anything, tell them anything. And then he began to preach against them. And he began to preach that the temple was going to be destroyed. And so by Thursday, he's arrested by the same people. And by Friday, he's dead. And by Sunday, he rose. And 40 days later, he ascends into heaven. So let's adjust Ben Knight's picture. Because maybe we do imagine God sitting on an ornate throne made of rare metals adorned with priceless jewels and upholstered in the finest fabric. Maybe we imagine that throne as human size. Maybe we, maybe we imagine it as many times larger. Maybe this picture we have that what's ever on the throne is so bright we can't make out what's there. But whatever we see when we imagine God the Father at the right hand, we have to see a human. A human with holes in his hands and his feet. Jesus at the right hand of God acting as the interceder. That's the image the book of Hebrews has. That's where Jesus is as that great high priest. And Hebrews is making the argument that Jesus is perfect for the role because we learn that he's been tested as we were. So he understands those of us who are being tested and is able to help us and we can put our trust in him. We learn that Jesus is able to sympathize us with our, in our weaknesses. And since Jesus understands our weaknesses, we can approach God boldly, not with barriers, but boldly in search of mercy and grace. Jesus is this perfect high priest who doesn't have to keep offering sacrifices for himself because he needed no sacrifice for himself and no more sacrifices are needed to mediate this because Jesus' death is the sacrifice once and for all. This is why after the crucifixion in the book of Mark, the temple that divides the Holy of Holies from the rest tore and the Holy of Holies was open as if God escaped and is now available to sit next to us thanks to Jesus. The author of the Hebrews would say that the reason we can imagine Jesus sitting across from us on a coffee shop or on our sofa the reason Jesus longs to hear how we are doing and what we're up to is because Jesus is that great high priest, that interceder between God the Father and us, whose perfect sacrifice once and for all bridged the gap between a sinful creation and a perfect God. And yet he understands us, helps us, and brings us great grace and mercy. So the Israelites screwed it up. How, we do, how do we screw this up? Um, I can think of two mistakes that we tend to make. The one mistake I think we tend to make is that we don't believe it. Not quit the church, tell everybody I'm now an atheist, kind of not believe it, but 
the not believe it in practice. We tend to cling to our mistakes. We tend to hold fast to our sins. It, it's easy for us to say Jesus forgives, but it's somehow different to say Jesus forgives me for the things that I do and for the things that I continue to do and the, the things I do I don't understand. I think that's why Brian McKnight wrote the devotional because he wants to tear down those barriers we put between us and Jesus to say Jesus wants to be that close to us. Does Jesus want to be at, that close to us when we do this? Yes. Does Jesus want to be that close to us when we have messed this up? Yes. Does Jesus want to be this close to us when we've sinned, when we've sinned deliberately, when we've sinned again and again and again? Yes. That's why he wrote it. And maybe Jesus then gets closer than we're comfortable with. And that's the challenge. But the second mistake I think people make is that they take it for granted. Because isn't God supposed to be forgiving? I mean, shouldn't God just love us the way we are? Isn't God supposed to be available to us whenever we call? Well, that's some therapeutic idea of God, that God exists to make us feel better and validate who we are. It's some kind of lifeguard God ready to help us when we get in over our heads. It's a, like a kind grandfather God, the one who's ready to slip us some money when we need it, need it and smiles at us and is always on our side. This is the kind of God that we have that God is for us rather than we being for God. It's mistaken, the created, for the creator. And we conquer that taking God for granted by purpose. 1 Peter 2 tells us this. We are being built into a spiritual house to be a royal, holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And he writes, we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, the same thing we find in Exodus 19. God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. The same calling the people of Israel had is ours. To represent God to those who do not go God through how we follow God. So that with Jesus as our high priest, we act as representatives to them. And we even intercede for them on behalf of God. Jesus' intimate relationship isn't just so we feel better for our days, but it's for a purpose. To send us out to be the chosen people and that royal priesthood. The book of Revelation says, to Jesus who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. There's more to say about this. And there's more to say about this because I skipped the stuff about the blood. And next week we'll talk more about the blood. But I want you to have this picture that's a first century picture of a God in ornate throne with Jesus standing at his right hand, still human, still like us. And that is the person who talks to God on our behalf. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for Jesus' obedience, even obedience unto death. We thank you for Jesus' obedience to you. We thank you that he now takes his place as our great high priest to intercede with us before God and to intercede with us to God.
to mediate that relationship between us, the imperfect creation, and a perfect God, so that we might be one and the day might come when heaven and earth combine and all evil and sin and death passes away. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Continue your ministry through us as a kingdom of priests. You pray for us, you guard us, you have given us your word, and you protect us from the evil one. Continue to watch over our church. Bless our tithes and our gifts. Bless our time and our talents. Bless the stewardship commitments we've made for next year and bless our relationships with each other so that by your spirit we might show others who you are. Thank you for this wonderful calling you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.
You may be seated. Our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession are responsive. When you hear me say, God of grace, hear our prayer, please respond, God of grace, please hear our prayer. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we pray that we too would be able to hold fast to our confession. When we are tempted by sin that would drag us away from you, let us cling to the rock that is Jesus. When we are threatened by an understanding of God's call in our lives that's uncomfortable, let us continue to look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. When holding to our beliefs becomes difficult because they clash with the values of our world or the values of our community or the values of our family and friends, turn our hearts toward you. Fill us with your compassion and let the peace that passes all understanding fill us. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of grace, please hear our prayer. We pray for a world that does not know Jesus as their great high priest. We pray for countries where different religions are fighting over their faith, especially for the conflict in Israel and Gaza and Jordan and Yemen. We pray for places where people are fighting between historically different people groups, where people were killed for no reason other than to whom they were born. We pray for countries ruled by dictators who consider their country land to be plundered for themselves rather than a people to care for. And we pray for the countries they invade. We pray for our country blessed by democracy and freedom of religion and freedom of speech and pray that we would not misuse our freedoms but always look for the good of all. Jesus Christ, please teach us how to witness our faith to our country and to our world in your name and in your way. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of grace, We pray for peace in our country and our world. We pray for your peace for those who suffered from the recent hurricanes that help would come quickly, but grant them peace and patience for the rebuilding that will be slower and more deliberate. We pray for peace for those living so closely to poverty, for those dependent on others to survive, for those who are one crisis away from homelessness, from those who are debilitated by illness and for those who are approaching death. We ask for your peace so that we do not have lives full of anger and blame or guilt and doubt or selfishness and insensitivity, but lives filled with your peace and love and grace. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of grace. We pray for those who lie closely to our hearts. Especially we pray for Harold and Connie and Dolly. We pray for Dan and for Letty, for Jean, for Joe and Linda. We pray for Sandy and Tom and Sandy and Julie. We pray for Kathy, for Stuart, for Enoch and Anya and for Betty. God of grace, hear our prayer. Let us pray the prayer Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So I'd like to repeat the chorus for you as our benediction. God Almighty, hear our prayer as we confess our need. From sin we need a Savior before your throne to intercede. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our great high priest, has shed his blood. That all who will may enter into eternal life is found in him. Abounding joy with hope and peace, salvation streams, eternal grace. Blessed be the Father Christ, the Son, our great high priest, the righteous one. So may your week be filled with that abounding joy and hope and peace and salvation that streams with eternal grace. So go in peace, for we are. Amen. Amen.